If you have your Bibles with you, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the Gospel according to John. The Gospel according to John. The 19th chapters I'll be reading from in just a few moments. I was telling Tony earlier this morning that um, all the years that I've been standing behind a pulpit, I do not believe I've ever preached from this text uh, at all. And in fact, I have probably read it in the past and thought, what is that? How does that apply to us today? And uh, when the Lord led me to go through this series of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross, this is one of the sayings. So I got to study it this week, really and truly, for the first time. So um, if you would stand with me, I'm going to read uh, God's word starting in verse 25 and following. And um, I would suggest these are the final words or the last words of a dying man. The scripture says this, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the life of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, we know that was John, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We do thank you for the amazing grace that has been, that we have sung together. And Lord, truly, we know that it will lead us home. And we thank you, Father, for being so good to us and uh, giving us instructions that we can walk on that higher ground. Lord, I pray that this morning that as we have gathered together in your house that you would speak to our hearts and that you would challenge us and help us to be ready and equipped for this week to make a difference for you. We ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. I can remember as um, a young boy playing cowboys and Indians I can remember going hunting on my dad's farm with the BB gun. I can remember playing in the creek, and I remember surviving a, a three-wheeler. That's before the four-wheelers came along. I can remember playing baseball and getting my license. I remember my first car wreck. I remember driving to school. I remember my first job. And I can remember all those things that are associated with being a senior in high school. I can remember as a high school senior and years after that of working in construction, and I can remember working all day long and then going to the gym and working out and still having the energy, but yesterday, just shoveling about one entrance into our building took about three and a half hours, and it just flat wore me out. I remember when that didn't happen. I also remember buying my first motorcycle. I remember starting college. I remember transferring to Bible College in Pineville. I remember going to serve at Pine Hill Missionary Baptist Church, then Lynn Camp Baptist Church. I remember playing softball all around. I remember a hayride to where I got to show off my muscles and help some little college student up on the wagon because she had a broken arm. I remember uh, falling in love. I remember Libby saying these words, it's time to go to the hospital. Not once, but twice. I remember that I used not to always say, what did you say? My hearing is not what it used to be. I remember when our girls starting school, I remember the motorcycle rides. I remember our first block party as a church. And I remember the night in Bethlehem. I remember getting my glasses. I remember our first mash. I remember Kentucky Changers. Uh, except for last year, we'd been seven or eight years in a row and just being physically worn out at the end of the day. See, I remember lots of things, and I know as I look back, a lot of things have changed. Uh, and what I have discovered as I look back is that I have aged. And I'm sure you remember as well, and you have aged uh, just as I have. And really, aging is a normal process of life. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Listen to what Solomon says. He says, remember your creator 
in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach you when you'll say, I find no pleasure in them. See, Solomon was speaking about the day of trouble. He describes uh, in that chapter uh, the slow deterioration of our bodies uh, in the declining of our years. Uh, he talks about how the arms and legs grow weary. He speaks about the, how the strong begin to stoop as they get older. He says the grinders or the teeth will be few. How eyesight grows dim and those that look through windows, uh, they, they just grow dim themselves and their voice gets weak. Getting older is really just a part of life. Things do change. And as we read the third saying of Jesus on the cross, as he hung there between 9 and 12 on that Friday in Jerusalem, there's a, a motley crowd that is around him, and uh, they're just there to watch. And notice what he says in verse 25 of our text. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. Mary is not the teenager any longer. She's older. The years have passed, and Jesus has grown up as Mary has too, and she's likely in her late 40s, maybe, maybe uh, early or low 50s. She's not a girl anymore. She's not a teenager. She's long past childbearing years, and she's past her 20s and 30s, and she's a widow. I think we at least know that for sure because Joseph is gone sometime, sometime between when Jesus was 12 and uh, his ministry. Joseph just dropped out of the scene. So here's Mary, older, and she's older. She's alone, and her shoulder's probably a little bit stooped, and she might have some silver uh, thread running through her hair. But she stands there at the cross with two others, and John the Apostle, and as she looks up at the cross, she sees her firstborn son. She has watched, I'm sure, them beat him. She has heard with the ears of a mother the cries of agony and the screams of pain. She's heard all the curse words, and she couldn't lift a finger to help at all. Now, I would say that only those who have watched their, their uh, loved one die could even begin to understand what Mary went through that day as she looked at the cross. But as she looks at the cross, she sees her son, and she sees just the shell of a man he used to be. She sees uh, one who's beaten almost beyond recognition, struggling and writhing in pain. And she sees this scene going on, all the emotions going through her, and the crowd is just jeering and laughing and loving every minute of it. And suddenly, in the midst of all this is happening, from the cross, Jesus looks down, he sees his mother, he sees John, and he makes this statement, Dear woman, here is your son. And to John, he says, here is your mother. Now, as Jesus made that statement from the cross, uh, it says from that time forward, it says that Mary took his mother, uh, John took his mother, Jesus' mother, home into his home to care for her. Now, we miss a whole lot of what is really happening there because we live in a different culture. Uh, but in Jewish thought, the instructions of a dying man were uh, just as much as if it was written down on paper. And uh, it, it was there. It was a, a, Jesus was saying, woman, here's your son. He's saying, here is your mother. It's as, as if he's writing his last will and testament and executing judgment right there. That's what he's doing. So he's saying uh, uh, to his mother, Mom, I'm leaving now. I'm not going to be able to take care of you any longer uh, after I'm gone. Uh, Mom, there's nothing I can do for you right now. Uh, you see, here's John. He's going to do for you what I would have done if I had been here. He's going to be the son that you need. And then John said to, uh, Jesus said to John, Do you see my mother? Take care of her after I'm gone. And he says, uh, do for her what I would do if I were still alive. So you ask, uh, as I probably have when I first looked at this text, I thought, why in the midst of all this agony would Jesus say what he said? It's because even though he was dying a, a terrible, agonizing torture on the cross, he was fulfilling the most basic responsibility and the most sacred obligation uh, that a son has ever had. He's making sure that his mother is cared for. Now, what does the Bible say? We know the Bible says that Jesus is a Jew. He was raised under the law. And the fifth commandment says, honor 
your father and your mother. That's what it says. It's not like Jesus had any other options at this point hanging on the cross. Uh, He knew his end was near. Hours he would be gone. He knew his mother, he couldn't give her any money. He likely had zero money to his name. He couldn't say, Mom, when I get off this cross, what we're going to do, I'm going to spend some time with you because he had no time to spend. He couldn't say, Mom, in a week or two, we'll get together just for lunch. No, uh, just he couldn't do that at all. All he could do in the dying moments was fulfill that final obligation that his mother would be taken care of after he's gone. Now, when I first read this passage, I was thinking to myself, what truth is there that we can have today? What can we take home with us? Uh, How does this apply to us today in 2021? But I want you to really think just for a moment, kind of outside the box. Although Jesus was uh, at the business of saving the world, he was not too busy to care for his parents. You see, because Jesus was the firstborn, he was expected to take care of the family after his father died. It's possible that he could have transferred that obligation to his brothers, but likely his brothers weren't there. They didn't believe in him. They didn't support what he was doing. So he asked John, John, will you take care of my mom? I'm going to be leaving. Will you treat her as I would as if she were your mother? And in this example... Jesus sets a pattern for us to see. We know that Jesus was on the mission to save the world, and there is nothing more important than saving the world. We all understand that. Yet while he was at that business of saving the world, he had time to obey the commandment, honor your mom and your dad. He had time to fulfill the Jewish custom to care for his parents, his mom, And I want to say this, that each and every follower of Jesus is on mission. You have responsibilities. We are called out of darkness into the light. We are called ambassadors for Christ. We've been given, as the scripture says, the ministry of reconciliation. Charles Spurgeon made this statement, and it hurts deep to the core. He says, we're all either missionaries or imposters. Now, as we fulfill this responsibility of being a missionary and fulfilling the responsibility of Scripture to honor your father and your mother, uh, how how do we do that? Uh, uh, And also realize that we'll never be discharged from that responsibility in the Word of God. No matter what we may accomplish in life, if we don't follow what God's Word says, it can't be considered a success. So we all know the Bible says, honor your father and mother. In the New Testament, it says, children, obey your parents. Now, I do believe that it's true that once you leave home, there will be times that you cannot obey your parents. We understand that. But there is never a time when it's okay for you not to honor your mom or your dad. Obey, not always, as you get older and leave home, but honor forever and always. Uh, No one is discharged from that obligation. And uh, if you use your Christianity as a reason not to care for your parents, uh, you're worse than an unbeliever, the Scripture says. Also, as a, a new Christian, if your parents are not following the Lord Jesus in faith, they're not following your example, and you use that as a reason not to care for them, uh, not to honor them, you're doing, you don't really understand what the Christian faith is all about. Now, here's what I know is true. We all want the world to be saved. That's, that's what we, we want to see those that don't know Jesus to come to a saving relationship with him. We want the gospel in every home. We want lives transformed. And we can be engaged in saving the world and sharing the gospel Uh, But while we're saving the world, let's do what Jesus did. Let's fulfill the obligations, the mandates in Scripture that are given unto us. We should never use our call of the Lord as an excuse to get out of our basic moral obligations. Now think about this. Where is the Lord Jesus when he makes this statement? Here he is on the cross, beaten, bruised, and bloody, if he, if he had time for his parents, 
while he is on the way to saving the world, then you ought to have time for yours. Now, that's a sacred scripture principle, honor your father and mother. Now, how do we do that? Where do we begin? I want to give you uh, uh, some action steps today um, of how to honor your parents. Now, one thing that we can all do is we can tell our parents that we love them. Now, some of you today might likely need to make a phone call. When's the last time you told your parents that you loved them? Some of you all may need to write a note just to say that I love you. Now, if it's been too long since you've done that, listen, if you're too busy to love your parents, you're too busy. If you're too busy to honor your parents, you're too busy. And if your life is filled with uh, uh, so much good stuff, you don't have time to care for those that brought you into the world, you have filled, you have filled your life with a bunch of junk. While you have time, while there is a chance, go to your parents and tell them that you love them. And one of the greatest ways to do that, as you tell me you love them, tell them about Jesus. But also, secondly, what we can do, how we can show our honor to our parents is remember them after they're gone. Maybe... One of your parents or both your parents have already died. What do you do then? Well, the Bible never says honor your parents only as long as they live. That's not what it says. You're supposed to honor your parents and as long as you live, whether they're alive or not. Now, how do you do that? Well, you do that by remembering them. Remember your mother and your father. And they say this is true, and I, I think it is. Uh, they say that one of the worst fears that we have someday is that when we die, people will forget that we were ever here. One way to honor your parents' memory is simply by remembering what they've done for you, how they sacrificed, how they went without, how they may, if they live a life of faith, following in the Lord, follow after them and honor them by doing the exact same. So we can tell them we love them and we can remember them after they're gone. But thirdly, if you can't say anything good, refuse to speak evil. Many of you all may not have had a mother like Mary. You may not have had a father like Joseph. Your parents may not have been there when you needed them. Perhaps there was a divorce or... Maybe uh, uh, they left you. Maybe you didn't know, uh, uh, don't know where your mom and dad are at all. Maybe they abused you and hurt you. So how can you honor them? You say, I just can't do what you're saying. You can honor your parents, listen very carefully, no matter what they have done, you can honor them even if they've hurt you by forgiving them. You can forgive them, and you can refuse to speak evil. You say, where's the gospel in all this? My friends, this is the gospel. This is what Jesus said when he was hanging on a cross just before he died. Think about this. Think, think, think. Jesus died just as he had lived, thinking of others. Isn't that not true? You look at his life, read the Gospels. He's always thinking of others. And here he is at the end of his life, as he's been brutally just beaten on the cross, he is still thinking of others. Think about the first word we talked about. He said, Father, forgive them. He was thinking about his enemies. Think about the second word he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He was thinking about a criminal who was guilty right by his side. His third word, woman, uh, behold, uh, here is your son. He was thinking about his mom. Jesus died just as he lived thinking about others. So we ought to be committed as Christians to, be, uh, to live the way he lived and to die the way that he died. He died not thinking of himself, but thinking of others. I'll say it again. He, was, he hung on a cross, and as he was on the way to saving the world, he had enough time to think of others. So must we, in life and also in death, take time for those who have cared for us to think about others. 
me give you a, a kind of a final word. This story certainly teaches us, I believe, that the church indeed ought to be a family. We talk and refer to a family of faith. And that ought to be more than a slogan, certainly. Now, why should that be? Well, the church, the Christian church, was founded by a family man. In the most difficult time, I'm sure, of his life, he was thinking about his mom. In the last hours, he was not thinking about himself. He was thinking about his family, and we ought to follow in his example. We know that Jesus was on mission. We know that to save the world, and we know why. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short the glory of God. The Bible tells us that there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it also tells us that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to seek and to save you and I. Everybody that we know, everybody that's ever been born, needs to be forgiven. And today, if you're here and you're in the parking lot or maybe you're uh, online watching, if you've never surrendered your heart and your life to Jesus, the good news is that today you can. You can do that this very day. So have you surrendered your life to Jesus? We're going to sing here in a few moments, and as we sing, if you're in person, I'm going to invite you to come down the altar. If you've never trusted Jesus, to come kneel at the altar and say, Jesus Forgive me. Save me. In the name of Jesus and what he's done on my behalf, I ask these things. And my friends, he'll save you. If you're out in the parking lot or you're online, whenever you're watching this, you can text that number on, your, on the screen. It'll come directly to my phone, and I'll get back with you very soon. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, if you claim Christ as your Savior, I can tell you something about yourself. You're on mission. Jesus' mission was to seek and to save that which is lost. If Jesus has changed you from the inside out, you're on mission as well as he is. You have the good news of what Christ has done on your behalf. And you are wanting to share with others what Christ has done for you. And maybe you'd say this to me, honest before the Lord, I've been off mission. I know I'm on mission, but I've been disengaged. I've been distracted by the pandemic. I've been distracted by the ice. I've been distracted by the mask. I've been off mission. The good news is that today, this very moment, that if we would confess our sins unto him, God is faithful and just. He'll forgive us and he can re-engage us and give us direction and God can use us from this point forward. There's another lesson I think we can find in this passage. We can learn a lot from what Jesus said to his mom, and then also to John. But think about John just for a moment. He's standing there seeing the one that has been brutally beaten, nailed to a cross. He hears this statement of Jesus to Jesus' mother. He looks at you and looks at John and addresses him, said, this is your mom. And notice what the Bible says. From that time forward, he did exactly what Jesus said. I wish it had the word immediately there, but I think it's, it's there. From that point forward, he took her into his house. He did what Jesus said. And that's a principle that I think that we need to remember as Christians Obedience brings blessings. Obedience brings blessings. Look how John was used by God 
and disobedience brings pain. Is that not true? When we obey what God says in his word, when we do what he asks us to do, we're blessed. But when we choose to be arrogant enough to say that I know more than God knows and I'm going to go by the way I feel rather than the truth that I know God says, it brings pain. The good news is today God wants to bless. He wants to bless, but we have to agree with him. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, Tony's going to come, and we're going to sing here in just a moment. But whatever decision God wants you to make, you're welcome to come to this altar if you're in person. Send me a text, if you will, if you're out in the parking lot or online. I love to hear and share with you what your next steps may be. But we're on, the exa- we're on a mission to follow the example of Jesus. We have a task at hand. And I believe the days are short. It's time for us to get busy. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word that we know is true. We thank you for the example of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for how even in the most horrible circumstances, Jesus honored his father and his mother. Lord, he had the obligation, as we do, to be thinking about others at all times. And you have given us a mission. God, we thank you for all that you have done and what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you guys so much for being here, being here and joining us uh, outside or online. Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your desire for our hearts and our lives. Lord, help us to learn from what Jesus said from the cross. Help us to be on mission this week. And I pray that you would use us. Use us, Lord, in the lives of others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.